Hello, everyone. Hi there. Thank you all for joining us today. Some of us are here face to face, but we also have a contingent of people who have joined us remotely. Thank you to both sets of participants. Thank you for those who have attended every time we've hosted one of these events. We really appreciate you coming to watch these presentations. First, I should remember to introduce myself. I am Dr. Ilaria Bertoletti. I'm the director of the Penn program and the organizer for this distinguished lecture series. Before we get started, I wanted to just talk about some logistics for this hybrid presentation today. For those of you who are here in person at the end of the talk, you can come up to the front and sign your question, or you can also use English. We do have interpreters here to facilitate both languages. It's important to recognize the presence of our interpreters. Thank you for being here today. For those of you who have joined us remotely, you can have the opportunity to communicate with us in two ways. We do have a chat that is open, which is more for general comments, uh, a way for you to share your thoughts. We have a separate formal QA chat box that can be used to pose your questions again after the talk is finished. If you're having technical difficulties with your video and you can't see us, please let us know in the chat for the Zoom and we will try to monitor that and solve any technical issues that you're having. Additionally, we have a captioner so if you would like the link to have a separate window in which to view captions, we can do that as well. And we're gonna put that in the chat very soon. I think that's it for the housekeeping issues. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our Penn student, Carly, who will be introducing our speaker today. Good afternoon, and welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture Series at Gallaudet University. Thank you so much for joining us today. This lecture series is an important annual event, hang on, to recognize and honor world-class leaders in the cognitive and educational neurosciences. This year, our theme is exploring the human mind from diverse perspectives. I am delighted to introduce today's truly distinguished lecturer, Dr. Nancy Canwisher. Dr. Canwisher joins us from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she is currently the Walter A. Rosenblith Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Dr. Canwisher is also a co-founder and investigator of MIT's McGovern Institute for Brain Research. Dr. Canwisher is held in the highest esteem around the world for her innovative research with the fusiform face area and the functional organization of the human brain in terms of perception and cognition. Her lab is particularly interested in how objects, faces, bodies, and places are represented in our brains. Dr. Kamwisher received both of her Bachelor of Science and her Doctor of Philosophy degrees from MIT. She also served as a faculty member at the University of California, Los Angeles and Harvard University before returning to MIT. She has since authored over 100 publications, which have been cited by thousands of others. Dr. Kenwisher's work has received impressive awards, such as the MacArthur Fellowship in Peace and International Security in 1986, the Golden Brain Award from the Minerva Foundation, in 2007, and the 2020 George A. Miller Prize in Cognitive Neuroscience from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society. 
Dr. Kanwisher is revered for her many unique contributions to the cognitive and educational neurosciences. She is also committed to making neuroscience research accessible for the general public. Having given a TED Talk and currently leading a series called Nancy's Brain Talks to disseminate work in the cognitive neuroscience field. Without further ado, I will pass the floor to Dr. Nancy Canwisher, who will present for us today. Thank you so much, Carly, for that lovely introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be here. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and an honor, and I've had so many, I've learned so many interesting things already. Uh, in just a half day's visit. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, so I wanna start this talk with some good news. And that is that our field of cognitive neuroscience has made a bunch of progress over the last 25 years or so. And one way to see that is to step back before that uh, and look at the approximate state of knowledge um, a few decades ago. When we, this is pretty much what we knew about the organization of the human brain. From studies of patients with focal brain damage, we knew that if you had damage to the left side of your brain, you might lose language abilities. If you had damage to the bottom of the right hemisphere, you might lose your ability to recognize faces. And if you had damage up in the parietal lobes, you might uh, be impaired in your ability to direct attention to different parts of space. Um, but that was more or less it. Uh, and then functional MRI came along, and here's roughly where we are today. So what this diagram is meant to show is that there are now dozens of regions of cortex for which we have a pretty good idea of what that little patch of cortex does. Um, and each of these regions shown here is present in approximately the same location in pretty much every normal person. Uh, so this is, of course, a highly schematic diagram. Uh, so let me tell you what the, what these um, what this abstract representation actually means. So here's the brain of a member of my lab who's a very good sport and did all of the experiments in the lab so I can show you all the things in his brain. And so we're looking up at the brain like this from below. And on the right, you have the right hemisphere and the left, the left hemisphere. So facing each other. And this brain has been mathematically inflated so that you can see the cortical surface. Uh, without hiding parts in, inside the folds. So the dark gray parts, parts are the parts that were inside a sulcus before they were mathematically inflated. And the light gray parts are the parts that are out on the gyrus. In color are the regions that we mapped with functional MRI. So this region here is the region that Carly mentioned that responds more to faces, that's the blue bar here, than to other kinds of visual stimuli like bodies and scenes and objects and words and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and so uh, just a couple of centimeters away is another patch of cortex uh, shown here, this green patch that responds much more when you look at images of scenes than when you look at other kinds of stimuli. And it responds zero when you look at faces. That means the same as when you stare at a dot, that's our baseline. Over in the left hemisphere is a particularly interesting patch of cortex um, named the visual word form area. Uh, because it responds strongly and selectively when you look at visually presented words and letter strings. Um, this region is particularly interesting because it's the one patch of cortex where we know that the selectivity of neurons in that patch of cortex are wired up by that person's experience. We know that because people have only been reading for a few thousand years, and that's not enough for natural selection to have wired up a specialized piece of cortex just to process a particular class of stimuli. Also, you don't see that selective response in this patch of brain in five-year-olds who haven't yet learned how to read, and you do see it when they're seven and now they know how to read. And finally, um, you see it only for the orthographies that person knows. So somebody like me who very lamely speaks only one language, uh, that region responds only to English letters. But if I spoke, say, Hebrew and Arabic as well, it would also respond to those orthographies. So all of those things tell us that that patch of cortex um, is, gets its selectivity from that person's experience. For the face and place areas, we don't know, but I'll dance around that topic later in the talk. Okay, if we look out on the lateral surface of the brain, 
we see some more good stuff, like these little purple patches here out on the side of the cortex, uh, respond more when you look at images of bodies and body parts than uh, faces or scenes or objects or words or other things. Now, um, this is, these selective responses are not restricted to visual responses. Um, in hearing people, these orange patches here respond to the sounds of speech. Um, with, and importantly, it's the sounds of speech, not the meaning of speech. So they, what they care about is the difference between different speech sounds, not the meaning of language. Um, and so you might wonder, do we have these highly specialized patches of cortex only for aspects of perception? Or do we also have them for more abstract aspects of cognition? And so um, a decade ago, my um, then postdoc, Ed Fedorenko, decided to tackle that question for the case of language. And so what she did was identify regions of the brain, shown here in red, that have been known for a long time, but she figured out how to identify them robustly within individual participants uh, that respond more uh, when you understand the meaning of a sentence than when you process meaningless um, um, sounds. And so these language regions, importantly, respond um, in hearing people listening to sentences, reading sentences, uh, and people respond who understand sign, and they respond also to sign. So they're not about the surface form of the language, they're about the meaning of the, of the language. So um, Ev wanted to know whether these regions for language are really specific for language. So what she did was identify these regions in these participants and then scan them while they participated in a whole suite of other tasks. The details don't matter, but it's lots of other tasks, uh, including working memory tasks, listening to music, um, uh, what else, um, uh, performing arithmetic tasks, all of these things. Uh, and she measured the response in all of these other tasks in these language regions. And here's what she finds. Here's the, in, in black is the response when people um, read sentences. And here's when they read meaningless strings of letters. And all of these other tasks produce pretty much no activation in that part of the brain, showing that those regions are really very selectively engaged in language per se. Um, and so that's uh, from basically Wernicke's area, a language region in the back of the temporal lobe. Here's a very similar kind of selective response to language up in Broca's area in the frontal lobe. And so I think this is particularly interesting because it's not just a selective patch of the brain uh, for another mental function. It tells us that actually language and thoughts are not the same thing in the brain. Something many people have wondered about that's been debated for a long time. Uh, and I think this is a very concrete answer to that question, saying that l language occupies particular brain regions that are separate from those that are engaged in other aspects of cognition. And even stronger evidence for that divide between language and thought comes from the work of Rosemary Varley in England. I have nothing to do with this work. I'm just a fan of the work. And what Varley has shown is she has spent many years testing patients who have the great misfortune of having huge left hemisphere strokes that just knock out all of language cortex. So these are people who not only can't speak, they also can't understand language. They've simply lost all language. And what Varley has shown is that pretty much every mental function that you might have thought would require language doesn't. So these people who have essentially no language can do arithmetic, they can solve logic problems, they can hold information in working memory, they can appreciate music, they can think about what another person is thinking. Again, showing strongly, strongly a divide in the brain between language and thought. Okay, another favorite region of the brain is this pink patch right here that responds quite selectively um, uh, when people think about what another person is thinking. This is the work of Rebecca Sachs. Should I move this? Okay, I was moving over because I saw I was going off the screen. So hang on one second. Let me just, um, maybe we move this over and this over. Then I can both be in the screen and be heard. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so I was talking about this pink patch here, the right temporal parietal junction in me, it's about right there, right there. Um, and uh, what Rebecca Sachs showed is that that region is remarkably specifically involved. Whoops. Oops, okay. Now I'm including it here. 
Oh, I see. By moving the computer, I messed it up. Let's go back in. Now, um, let's, let's try putting this down without. Are all the pieces in place? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I was talking about this pink patch here that Rebecca Sachs worked on, showing through many, many experiments that that region is remarkably specifically engaged when you think about what another person is thinking. And if that strikes you as ridiculous, why would we have a patch of brain for that? Uh, I submit that this is kind of the essence of being a human being, is to spend a lot of your waking hours thinking about what other people are thinking. We care much more what goes on inside their heads than what they look like on the outside. Whoops, am I blinking? Okay. Uh -uh. okay. Okay, so we'll just move this over. And yeah. Yeah. How's that? We got the screen. Got the <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have all these highly specialized bits of brain, um, but I don't think that's the only, uh, the only kind of stuff we have in our heads. Um, and in fact, uh, there's wide swaths of cortex shown here in white that are sometimes called multiple demand cortex because they respond to multiple different kinds of cognitive demand, almost independent of what exactly the task is. Uh, and so uh, here's uh, showing you um, that, that in each of these regions, you find a, a stronger response in a difficult compared to an easy version of the same task. So the filled bars are the difficult version and the empty bars are the easy version of many, many different tasks. Okay, so they're like the opposite of all those hyper-specialized regions. Okay, so that's my whirlwind overview of some of my favorite patches of cortex. And so I think this counts as real progress. We didn't know about all of these things 25 years ago, that we have this set of functionally distinctive regions present in pretty much everyone, including regions specialized for abstract, uh, distinctively human functions like language and thinking about what other people are thinking. And so I think of this as initial, an initial sketch of who we are. Uh, but it's also just the barest beginning. Finding a little blob on the brain and putting a word label on it is a very rudimentary enterprise. And so really, I think the way to think about this diagram is as a roadmap for research. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is uh, consider a set of questions that are raised by this diagram and show you little teeny bits of progress we're making trying to answer each of them. So the first one is, with functional MRI, we look at the responses of different patches of the brain when people do different things but that doesn't show that those regions play a causal role in those particular mental functions. And in science, we care about causality, not just what, hap what tends to go along with what, we care about what causes what. That's the essence of scientific theories is all about cause. And so we can't tell that from functional MRI. We can't tell what the causal role is in behavior. Um, and that's why I was very excited when um, a bunch of years ago, I got a phone call from a colleague telling me that this gentleman was awaiting neurosurgery in a hospital in Japan. Uh, and they had, this neurosurgeon had placed electrodes over the bottom of his brain uh, to map out their surgical route and to discover the focus of his epileptic seizures. Um, and this gentleman had very kindly agreed to allow us to record from those electrodes while he was in the hospital, while he looked at different kinds of visual stimuli. Um, and to show you why I was excited about um, the locations of these electrodes, Here's the bottom surface of my brain showing my face selective regions in red, my place selective regions in green, and regions that prefer color uh, to grayscale in purple. So we sent some stimuli and they sent us some data that looked like this. So each of these little graphs is one of those electrodes on the surface of his brain. And so you can see, for example, these electrodes right here, right in this part of his brain, 
uh, responding, this is time on the x-axis. They're responding very strongly when a face is presented, that's the red curve, and pretty much not at all when other stimuli are presented. So if you found, when I showed you those functional MRI data, that, oh, there's a pretty strong response even to things that aren't faces, uh, I think when you have the, the better methods of recording directly from the surface of the brain, you see really strong selectivity in those patches of cortex. Okay, but that's still not causality. That's just higher spatial resolution and time information. I got into this by saying that causal information is important. And so the neurosurgeons had decided, for clinical reasons, they, they needed to electrically stimulate each of those electrodes to ask the patient what he experienced when stimulated there. So I'm going to show you a videotape of this guy describing what happens. It may or may not have, it may have sound, but, oops, sorry. Um, but you can read the subtitles to see what happens. He's speaking Japanese anyway, so. <laughs> a very good participant. He wants to tell us exactly what he's experiencing. He doesn't know there's a face area. He doesn't know where the electrodes are. He's just asked to tell us, does anything change? You can see the stimulation in the corner. So that shows the causal role of that region in face perception. So here he's being stimulated while looking at something that isn't a face. So he's just looking at a box, and he sees a face on top of the box when stimulated there. Here he's looking at a kanji character on a card right there. So he's looking at a character, and when stimulated on that face selective electrode, he sees a face on top of it. So this is causal evidence. It's rare and precious, and we don't usually get it, but when we do get it, it's pretty powerful. And it tells us those regions are not just activated when you look at a face, they're causally involved in face perception. Um, when he was stimulated next door in electrodes that respond more to color than grayscale, he saw rainbows on top of whatever he was looking at. Um, so all of that suggests that we don't have data that beautiful for each of these regions, but it says that when we've had the opportunity to test, we find um, that causal methods recapitulate the selectivity we see with functional MRI. Okay, so second question. It's a, an obvious question when you look at this diagram. There's all these specialized bits. What else? Uh, and so we've been asking that question for a decade or more. Um, and there's a number of other uh, specialized regions that we've been looking at, candidates. And one is that, um, that we social primates spend a lot of time looking at other people, and we look at their faces and their bodies, and we listen to their voices. Um, but, uh, but we don't just look at individuals. We also care about social situations. And sometimes we look at two other people interacting, and we see that this is a social interaction going on. And we might even see, do they like each other? Is it a positive interaction or a negative interaction? Uh, and so in another line of work, 
uh, Leila Ishik and Candy Coldwin have been looking at a little patch of cortex over here in the right superior temporal sulcus uh, that seems to be selectively involved in perceiving social interaction between pairs or more of people. But of course, we care about interactions not only among people, we care about physical interactions between objects. If you see one object colliding with or hitting another object, um, that's a salient event. We need to understand the physical basis of the world as well. In fact, we can't carry out a single action in the world without some understanding of the physics of the world we're acting on. I can't pick up this pen without having some idea in my mind in advance of its weight and friction. I can't walk across the room without thinking about whether it will support my weight, etc. So this understanding of the physical world is an area that we're studying in some ongoing work. Uh, and I'll just say that, um, that uh, oh, I put the slide back in. Okay, so here's some of the work showing that, uh, that we think that there's a set of, of parietal and frontal regions that are involved in our understanding of the physical world. It's early days, but here's a, a few little bits of evidence. Um, we gave subjects, we showed subject videos of these towers here rotating around, and we asked them for the physics task, uh, if that tower falls, will there be more blocks on the red side or the green side? Or we said, are there more blue or yellow blocks? Okay, and in that contrast, we find these regions here that seem to be more involved in the physical task than the color task. Uh, we also showed two dots moving around in the screen, either interacting with each other physically, like bouncing into each other and ricocheting off the walls, or interacting socially, chasing, flirting, etc., just by the motion of the dots. And again, we find those same regions more engaged when you see dots engage, interacting physically rather than socially. And in other work, we've used pattern analysis methods to ask what information is encoded there. And we've shown that you can decode a little bit uh, the weight of an object in a video from that region, whether the configuration of objects in the scene is unstable like this or stable like that. Um, and whether the relationships between the objects, whether the objects are in contact or not. All things that matter for building a model of the physical world and predicting what will happen next. Actually, in the, our most recent experiment, we can decode from that region the subject's prediction from a short video of objects moving what's gonna happen next, suggesting that what we use this physical model for is running simulations on the world and making predictions. So the hypothesis we're working toward, which we're very far from proving, uh, is that these brain regions implement our understanding of the physical world, and it's based on some kind of model in our head of how the world works so that we can use that model to predict what's gonna happen next. Kind of like in video games, video games have a physics engine that the video game um, um, software uses to generate the next images, because it's also predicting what's gonna happen next. So there's lots of open questions. I'm just giving you a flavor of one of the kind of new regions we're investigating. Okay, so um, that's all fun and games where we uh, come up with a hypothesis of a mental function that might have a specialized region of the brain and we go test it and try to find evidence for or against that hypothesis. Um, but I've also been excited by another kind of uh, experiment, which is instead of formulating a specific hypothesis in advance, we collect a whole big bunch of data and apply some math, which basically is a way of asking your data to speak to you. Um, so this is work that was done uh, with me and my colleague, Josh McDermott. Um, and what we did was we were trying to understand the organization of auditory cortex in hearing subjects. And so we presented 165 different sound clips, little two second audio recordings of the sounds of common objects like man speaking, toilet flushing, ambulance siren, dog barking, et cetera. And so subjects are lying in the scanner and they hear each of these sounds and we scan their brains. And from that, we get a big matrix of data, 11,000 voxels in the brain across 10 subjects uh, by 165 sounds. So each column in this data matrix is the response of one little two by two by two millimeter piece of somebody's brain uh, to each of those 165 sounds, okay? And so then we apply math to kind of take that data matrix and make it talk to us. Uh, and the particular math is called independent component analysis. The details don't matter, but it's basically a way of boiling that matrix down to its essence. 
And what we find when we do that is six components account for most of the data in that matrix. And those components include uh, a response profile over the 165 sounds. And when we put the labels back on the data to see what those are, we see that, um, that one of the components is a response to high frequency sounds, another component is a response to low frequency sounds, and that recapitulates what's been known for a long time about primary auditory cortex. It has a map of frequency space across auditory cortex, just as visual cortex has a map of visual space. So that's a nice positive control. But we also found two new components that emerged from this data analysis. One was a selective response to speech sounds, and that was kind of cool. But my favorite is this one here that had a response to sounds shown like this. And I've color coded, this is the 165 sounds, the magnitude of MRI response to each. And I've color coded them um, by these um, different categories here. And if you look, you see that each of these um, sounds that produces a strong response is music. And what's interesting about this is that the music sounds are wildly variable across each other. It's anything from a heavy metal band to a classical flute so solo to a drum solo. All of these things that are acoustically so different produce a strong response in that region of the brain. And I thought that was pretty awesome and we published it, but I was sort of nervous because we had to do so much math to get this result that I was always nervous that it was somehow concocted in the math and wasn't true in the raw data. So I was very excited when over the next five years, we had the chance to record responses to the same set of sounds in patients with uh, electrodes implanted in their cortex for pre-surgical planning, like the Japanese guy I showed you before. And there we found individual electrodes with the same strongly selective response to music uh, in patients with electrodes in, which to me nails the case. And I think this is just fascinating because nobody knows why humans have music in the first place, right? It's ubiquitous across cultures, and it's been a mystery um, for probably since the Greeks, but at least Darwin wrote about it as one of the big mysteries about humans and their culture is, you know, why, why, do, why do hearing people like it when they hear this set of sounds? What is up with that? So this doesn't answer that question, but it shows that it's not just a byproduct of something else in the brain. Okay, so that's an examples of some of the things we've done to try to discover new specialized regions in the cortex. Um, but an, another obvious question is, how do you wire up a brain with all of these particular regions? How does that work over development? And so lots of studies had focused on the face regions and had argued that the selectivity of those regions developed very slowly, continuing straight into adolescence. Um, and um, one study in monkeys, monkeys have the same face selective patches, and so Marge Livingstone at Harvard had scanned monkeys without ever letting them see faces. So they had lots of visual experience, um, lots of social experience in the dark, uh, but they never saw faces. And she found that those monkeys did not develop face selective patches. So these results led a number of researchers to argue that the face selective regions at least um, take years to be built uh, and depend on visual experience a reasonable conclusion from those data. Uh, but we wanted to revisit that question. And so one problem with the prior studies is that all the studies of the face patches in humans were done on kids age four and up. And that's both too late because they've already had lots of experience and it's too early because it's really hard to scan kids. Um, and so really what we wanted to do was scan infants but that's even harder. In fact, it's nearly impossible. However, lucky me, my dear friend and colleague, Rebecca Sachs, shown here in the middle, she and her then grad student, Ben Dean uh, and Hillary Richardson um, and her intrepid uh, number one subject, her own son, Arthur, collectively spent five years figuring out how to scan infants and they nailed it. And so they collected amazing data like this. This is the brain of a six-year-old showing you regions that respond more to scenes than faces in blue and more to faces than scenes in yellow, loosely recapitulating the approximate pattern we see in adults already present by age six, at uh, six months. Um, but that's wonderful. But um, these data don't let us see exactly how selective those regions are. We can barely detect this pattern at all. 
And so a really amazing grad student working with me and Rebecca Sachs, Heather Kosakowski, uh, decided to take on this problem. And so she designed her own infant functional MRI coil, working with some physicists. Here it is with an infant here, with these infant designed headphones and these pieces of plastic with the MRI detectors that get snugly placed around the infant's head, bringing the detectors closer to the kid's head so that we get higher signal to noise and better data. And then even more amazingly, Heather scanned 83 infants in the course of a PhD. This is really remarkable. I'll say as a sidebar, before I got involved in this project, I thought, well, I'll just watch Heather scan a kid. And it was astonishing. I was just standing back in the scanner control room. Heather is there, the parents are hanging out, they're nervous, the kid is screaming. Heather is calm as a cucumber. She's bouncing the kid, the kid is still screaming. This goes on for 15 minutes. I think this is ridiculous. Somebody needs to pull the plug. This is a train wreck. But I kept my mouth shut. And sure enough, 20 minutes in, the kid shut up, got calm, smiled, went into the scanner, and Heather got beautiful data. It's incredible. Um, so what Heather, yeah, okay. So what Heather managed to show uh, is that in six month old infants, not only could you detect face, place, and body selective regions, you could show uh, the precise selectivity of each of these regions. Here's the face area response to faces, much higher than other things. Place area responding more to places than other things, and body area responding to bodies more than other things. So um, that says, skip that slide, that says that the, these regions do not take many, many years to develop. They're already there by five or six months of age. So what about this other question? Do they require visual experience to be developed? And so my postdoc, Ratan Murthy, decided to tackle this question um, in a different way. Uh, he asked whether congenitally blind people who had never seen anything at all, let alone faces, might have some version of a face selective patch of cortex. So he did that by generating um, these 3D printed objects that you see here, um, Velcroing them onto a disk of cardboard in the scanner standing outside the scanner board and rotating the cardboard every few seconds so that the blind subject could just hold their hands in one place and feel each object as it went by. Um, and then asking whether we see face selective responses. So here's what you see looking at the bottom of the brain in sighted people looking at those stimuli, faces higher than non-face objects. That's the usual face selective region. Here's what you see in the congenitally blind people feeling those same stimuli. You can see it's a little weaker, but in recognizably the same part of the brain, you get a higher response when a blind person is feeling that face than when they feel the hands or chairs or mazes. And the response profiles are similar in that region for both the sighted and the blind subjects. Um, so no, apparently you don't need to ever have seen a face to have a face selective patch in your cortex. Uh, and none of this answers how this stuff develops, but it puts some constraints on it. However these things develop, they happen pretty fast. They're already there by six months. Uh, and at least the face patch can arise without face experience. Okay, how do these things arise throughout evolution? I'm absolutely not gonna answer that question, but I'll show you one little speck of data. Um, and that is um, um, this, this here. So this is the bottom surface of the brain that I've been showing you all along. Face selective regions in purple, color preferring regions in blue, and place selective regions um, in green. Here's the side of a monkey brain looking at the same stimuli, showing you that in the monkey brain, you see a, a kind of strikingly similar organization. It goes faces, color, places, and three bands on the side of the monkey brain. In humans, it's rolled around on the ventral surface, but still faces, color, places in the same order. And that seems like such a weird, unpredicted order, such a kind of recognizably similar pattern that it looks very much like the, this organization has been inherited from a common ancestor, um, which we haven't shared with macaques for 30 million years. So um, it's just suggestive, but it suggests a, a, an old evolutionary root. Okay, next question. What is represented and computed in each of these regions? Um, you, I'm sure that everyone here has heard about the astonishing recent success of artificial neural networks. 
they're the reason our phones can now label photographs with the names of our friends, even when we don't ask them. And like, what, what, how did, how did you know who that was? The reason that our phones can take dictation, the reason that, um, you know, all the, all the amazing advances in AI that have happened in the last 10, 15 years are all based on artificial neural networks. Um, and so what are these things? I'm not a computer scientist, so very simply, um, they are um, computer algorithms that consist of layers of units, each of which gets input from the previous layer, uh, and it does some kind of nonlinear sum of its inputs to compute the next stage, such that when you train these things to do simple tasks, like recognize an object, you put in an image of an orange, and it has a thousand different labels, and it activates the right one and says that's an orange. After millions of training trials, these things now work pretty well. And that didn't used to be. When I started off in this field, we did not have models like this. So why is that relevant to neuroscience? Well, because this is the first time we've had any computational model of how vision might work in the brain, right? We, we didn't have any working models before. But so then the question is, do brains work like that? And there's lots of reasons to think that they might not, because these artificial neural networks differ from brains in so many ways. They are not designed to mimic brains. They're extremely different from brains in the hardware, in the learning rules, in the data they're trained on, in pretty much everything you can think about, they're really different. And so how do we find out how similar they are to brains? Uh, well, there's a bunch of ways, but one standard way uh, is the following. We take one of these artificial neural networks trained on object recognition that works pretty well on object recognition, we then um, measure the, a neural response to lots of different images. This is data from monkeys from my colleague, Jim DiCarlo. And so he measured the response of a single neuron in a high level visual cortical region called infratemporal cortex to uh, several hundred different natural images like these. And so then he gets a response magnitude shown here. This is of one neuron in the visual cortex of a monkey to each of those stimuli. These are all the faces in the middle. So this is a face selective neuron. Okay, so then what he does is he takes the same images and he feeds them into the network. And he collects activations in the network. He propagates that image through the network and collects the activity in a late layer of the network. Then he fits a simple um, um, equation here where he simply solves for a different weight for each of the units in the network, such that when you feed in an image and collect the activations, if you take each activation and multiply it by its own weight and add them up, you get the response of that neuron, okay? And you do this on a subset of the stimuli, and then you freeze the weights and ask how well it predicts the response to a held out image. So how well does that work? Okay, so here are the predictions. It works really well. So red are the predicted response to each of those images from that neuron in a model that was fitted, not including that image, okay? So this is really, I think, quite remarkable. And it echoes some, and it suggests there might be some similarity between these artificial neural networks and brains. And I think it's really strong evidence for a beautiful um, hypothesis put forth by David Marr, who was a visionary vision scientist in my department uh, back in the 80s. And Marr said that the nature of the computations that underlie perception depend more on the computational problems that have to be solved than on the particular hardware in which their solution is imp implemented. In other words, if you have a particular problem to solve, like object recognition, um, they're, they're, the solution depends on the structure of that problem more than whether it's being done by a brain or an artificial neural network. And here we have evidence for that. Okay. Um, okay, so my postdoc, Ratan Murthy, decided that that was cool, and he was gonna try the same thing with functional MRI data. And I'll admit that at the time, this is about four or five years ago, I was like, oh my God, I don't know any computer science. I'm waiting for these artificial neural networks to blow over, it's not my thing, and this isn't gonna work, and it's not gonna tell us anything, and why do you wanna do it? And mercifully, he didn't listen to me, he just did it. Um, and what, he did very much the same thing that I just described to you but now with functional MRI, and he measured the response of each of these regions, the face, place, and body selective regions, um, to a couple hundred stimuli each. And then he did the same thing, fitting weights from an artificial neural network trained on object recognition, um, based on the subset of the stimuli, 
from which he derived a predicted response to each image. And then we have the observed response to each image. You can see the correlation between the predict, each dot is a stimulus. The correlation between predicted to observed is 0.9. I don't think I've ever gotten a correlation of 0.9 in my life before. Um, and that was true for each of these regions. And what that means is we can predict how those patches of brain are gonna respond to a completely new image that nobody has presented a brain with before. And that blows my mind. We are actually now um, we're, um, regularly in my lab piloting experiments on our AI models before we run the actual experiments on brains. Something I never dreamed would happen before, but these models are so accurate that we can usually get the correct experiment, the correct answer before we run the experiment. Um, okay, so that's cool, but what are we gonna do with these things? Well, one thing we can do is we can run experiments on the models that we could never run on brains. So for example, the claim that that face region responds more to faces than anything else is really a claim over the infinite set of other images, which I haven't scanned people looking at yet. So it's kind of a reckless claim. And so how do we decide which other images to scan? Well, what Ratan figured is now that this model is so accurate, we can run the model over a weekend on the entire machine learning image database of 3 million images. And we can ask it, what are the top 100,000 images that you're gonna produce the strongest response to? And we ch can check and see, and maybe some of them aren't faces, and then we will have falsified the hypothesis. Of course, we'll have to run the experiment to test if it's true, but this is a powerful way to falsify your own hypothesis, something that we scientists should be excited about, if a little nervous. <laughs> so we were very excited and we did that. And Ratan and I looked at the top 100,000 images and they were all faces. Uh, same deal for the place and, and body regions. They were all places or all bodies. So there's a lot of other cool things you can do with these models that you can't do on real brains. And we're really going to town doing all of these things. One thing you can do is you can use a slightly different kind of artificial neural network that generates an image designed to optimally activate a region. And when you do that for the face area, you get this. Place area, you get that. Body area, you get that. So I'm counting, I'm counting these as kind of supporting the hypothesis of what these regions are selected for. Okay, so there's lots of other cool things we can do with the models, um, but my favorite, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Do I have another 510, is that okay? Okay, all right. Uh, my favorite is that we can ask why questions. We can ask why the brain is organized the way it is and why it has the properties it does. I used to end every talk for 20 years saying, okay, we have all these specialized brain regions. Isn't that cool? Why is that a good way to design a brain? I have no idea, end of talk. And I thought there was just, that was a kind of question you couldn't answer. But I now think that we can each at least approach that question with artificial neural networks. So by we, I mean my uh, then postdoc Katerina Dobbs, a computer scientist who can work with these networks, which I have no idea how to do. Um, and so what we decided to do is ask this question of why the brain should have specialized machinery for face recognition. And so um, the first thing we did was to test our intuition that, um, that faces, that different kinds of visual features matter for face recognition and for object recognition. And therefore, that's maybe why we wanna segregate them in different parts of the brain. Like maybe to recognize faces, you need to detect features that have more curvy properties, whereas recognizing objects, maybe they're more straight edge properties or angles or who knows what, right? And so to test that, we trained one network only on face recognition and another network only on object classification. And then once those networks were trained, we took the face network and showed it new faces and asked how well it could tell them apart and it did great. We showed it objects and it couldn't tell them apart at all. Consistent with the idea that a network optimized to pick out features optimized for face discrimination, it's gonna do badly at object recognition. And we also showed the opposite. If it's optimized for object recognition, it's very bad at discriminating faces. So that was our first evidence. But then I said, let's push this harder. Um, if the reason we have a separate patch of the brain for face recognition is that you just need separate machinery to solve it, let's see if we can train one network on both face discrimination and object recognition. And we won't tell it, these are the faces, these are the objects, we'll just mix them all together in the training set. And my prediction was it would do badly because it would be forced to solve two different problems with one architecture and it would make a bad compromise and do badly. 
Well, that prediction was totally wrong. It was great at both face and object recognition. And at first, I was like, damn, I like that hypothesis, and apparently it's wrong. But then, as one does when one falsifies one's hypothesis, one thinks a little bit more. And we thought, let's look inside that network and see how it's organized. And so we decided to try a lesion experiment on the network. And so we took the units from this stage of the network, and we found the ones that responded most to faces. Um, and we lesioned the top 20% most face responsive um, units in here, and then tested the model on face and object recognition. And we saw that its face recognition performance had gotten really bad, and its object recognition performance was great. We then lesioned a different 20% uh, of units that responded more to objects than faces and looked at its performance. And that network was great at face recognition and lousy at object recognition. So what we've done here is a classic neuropsychology double dissociation um, showing uh, that they, there's two different, there's basically this network has uh, developed, it has spontaneously created two separate pathways, one for face recognition and one for object recognition even though we built in absolutely nothing to tell it that faces and objects matter and they're different, no priors about faces, nothing about the distinction between these things. It's just taken that visual input and somehow figured out from the statistics of the problem that we need two different parts of the architecture to solve that. So I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, and to me, it gives, us, um, it gives us a beginning of an understanding of why we have this organization in the brain is this is simply what an optimized solution looks like. And it doesn't matter whether the optimization is done by biological evolution and learning, as in brains, or by fancy machine learning methods that take a network and train it to become good at the task. Um, so um, that doesn't answer the question, but in terms of what is represented and what is computed in each region of the brain, I think these, these artificial neural networks are providing promising new ways to tackle all these problems. Um, they also, we can also test behavioral phenomena. Uh, artificial neural networks trained on face recognition recapitulate basically the whole suite of behavioral properties of face recognition that have been reported over the last 40 years. They have face inversion effects, they have other race effects, they have all the things that humans have. Uh, so it seems like all of those things result from optimization for face recognition. Um, so I'm excited in particular about the use of these networks to answer why questions Thank you so much for your presentation. It was fascinating and I've learned a lot. I really appreciate um, your presentation. It's inspired a lot of thoughts and a lot more thinking about my own research. If people do have questions, we're gonna go ahead and allow two options. There's the QA chat for our remote participants. For those in the audience, please raise your hand and then you can come up here and ask a question and sign on camera so that the remote audience can view you as well. I see Melissa already has a hand up. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for such a fascinating talk. I enjoyed so much of it. And I now have two questions. The first, the part where you were talking about music and the area that selectively responded to the 165 clips and that music of any kind really kind of triggered this response or prompted it and the criticality of it. And it makes sense that there's something about how humans are wired. We like rhythm, we like rhythmic things. Do you have thoughts on what that means for deaf people and what an equivalent experience is for what's prompting that response in hearing people. Because I think there's perhaps something that's maybe not auditory that still is rhythmic. So do you have any guesses or theories? I've got some guesses in mind, but wondering what yours are. I wanted to ask you that same question. Yeah. Probably in the middle of them. I'll get out of this the screen so that the interpreter can be seen. Again. I love that question. And actually, as I was preparing this talk, I thought, am I going to talk about music to deaf people? What is that going to mean to them? Oh my God, I would love to understand this question. So yeah, I, I do know. too. 
I don't know, but I would love to learn. Um, I would love to talk more about this. Um, I remember many, many years ago hearing Evelyn Glenny. I don't know if you guys know of her. She's a she's a deaf drummer, and she's amazing. Um, and uh, but I don't know. I don't know very much about what the correlate would be of an experience of music in deaf people. I think it's super interesting. And and I'll just say as a sidebar. Um, well, as I mentioned, nobody knows why why humans like music in the first place. It's pretty weird, right? It's just a sensory experience that doesn't map onto anything of direct biological relevance. Why would you like that? You know, and why, it's just very strange. Um, I don't think anybody has a good answer to that. I'm gonna come back in frame. And I'm really happy that you decided to keep that part in your talk. I think it's really intriguing, really fascinating. Um, and so I don't have an answer either, by the way. I think it's definitely a topic for um, open for discussion. I think there's also something really interesting just about rhymes and rhyming. So obviously music is composed of beats and all kinds of things. And I do motion capture. And early on, we looked at nursery rhymes and ways to create nursery rhymes with rhythms in American Sign Language. And in doing that, we got this visual representation of rhythm through motion capture data, where we would see, like some signs, you would see this sort of shape. And we thought it was interesting because it sort of was like visual evidence of a rhythm in sign language in a way. I mean, you can see it even if you don't know how to sign, but it's not something that we pursued. It's like when you sign in a rhythmic fashion, it then seems to prompt something in the brain to produce that a little differently. So it's more rhythmic and less linguistic. Like, and it's a way that we can sort of provide early linguistic support for infants like all babies seem to remember these nursery rhymes and we use these sorts of rhymes as they're developing their language and deaf babies are no different. They're just getting their input through a visual modality. So it's an area that I'm very curious about, especially the stimulus that you were using. Anyway, is anyone else understanding? Does that make sense? Super fascinating. So, so are you saying that deaf babies who um, particularly resonate to this, these kind of rhythmic signs that, that you're describing? I think that's yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we don't have any sign of kind of strong evidence. You know, we just have some very early, early findings of some sort. And we really need research in this area. You know, we need a team. We need grants. We need all the support we can get really to find out the answer to this. And I think your study sort of made me think about, right, if we were to just shift this a little bit, if music does this response, what's the parallel in other individuals? And yeah, so I was just wondering overall, that's piqued my curiosity. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. We could ask, in, in principle, we could ask empirically whether um, deaf people uh, looking at this rhythmic sign activate the same regions of the brain. It's possible, right? Because as I'm sure you guys have encountered, there's lots of evidence for some yeah. organization of the brain in early deaf people and parts that, that would be auditory cortex and hearing people respond a lot to visual information. Maybe they respond a lot to rhythmic visual information. I don't think that's known. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder that same thing. I'm, I'm definitely very interested. Maybe somebody here wants to collaborate with me, this would be great. My second question for you. <laughs> um, my second question is a little bit more of a broader question. Um, thinking about ethics involved in neuroscience. So I'm looking at this at a broader level. I understand that we are gaining increased knowledge and understanding our brain better, but I guess there are some people who are manipulating and where do we stop people from overly manipulating that mm -hmm, in terms of what they're doing? So what I mean by that is I understand the, the medical impact or do we understand that if this is something for the benefit of people by these manipulations that we're doing? Are there any adverse possibilities or outcomes 
Um, I'm thinking sort of just generally ethically your thoughts or stance on the advances we're making where we're going in the next 10 years if there's anything you're concerned about what about what people are doing yeah um, I am not worried at the moment but maybe I should be uh, I'm not saying I shouldn't be but um, <laughs> okay well that's a relief uh, I think that um I I think that if anything the stuff we learn is going to help both understand human beings and what it means to be a human and maybe someday um, help with, you know, neurological disorders. I will say that at the moment, uh, I'm sad to say, I don't think any of my research has helped with anything clinical. It bugs me. I wish it did. Um, but I think that, you know, it, we're not there yet. Aside from a, a few neurosurgeons who have called me and said, well, I need to remove a seizure focus on this part of the brain. Where do you recommend I go? And I was like, oh, my God. I can't answer that question. That makes me very nervous. Wow, that's really interesting. They're calling you. Well, just a couple of times, and I, I discouraged it because I am so not uh, equipped to answer that. Mm. But what I can do is say, look, I, I can give you a very simple functional MRI paradigm that will enable you to localize all of the regions I showed here in 25 minutes, almost all of them, in 25 minutes of scan time. And you could then give your patient a choice, like if you had to go this way or that way. They could have some role in deciding. I don't know. That's not maybe incredibly useful, but but I don't see. I mean, the methods that we have here are great as basic research um, tools, but we can't do anything really interesting like read out contents of percepts or thoughts or anything scary like that. Our methods just aren't good enough to be able to actually you know, invade somebody's privacy by neural recording. Um, and I don't think we're going to get there in humans because of all the limitations of the methods available in humans. So I'm not worried at the moment, but I remain open to hearing stories of a particular one. Okay, fair enough. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, you're coming over. You've seen up there. You're there okay. you go. Right. All right. Hi, everyone online. Hi to everyone in the audience. Hopefully, everyone can see everything at the same time. It's a little complicated. So, I'm really interested in the topic that's a little bit controversial uh, at the time when I was a graduate student. So, looking back, I guess I'm wondering about your thoughts and opinions about. The first, the reverse inverse problem. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Inference yeah, problem. Mm -hmm. Especially, I'm looking back and thinking about a pretty popular publication that came out at that time that was specifically about the anterior cingulate cortex. <laughs> Right, so you're very familiar. Uh, this was a huge deal and a huge debate in neuroscience. So that's just a little bit of background then. So some of the conclusions from that article were specifically saying, oh, when we see activation that's extremely strong in this area, this is about social. Pain, mm -hmm. yep, it's about social pain. So we're seeing, that's what we're seeing. But then of course, additional studies said, no, it's not really about social pain. It's more about if you have an expectation and you've predicted something and now the thing has actually happened and it's not what you expected or predicted. So it's an expectation violation. So I'm wondering about your thoughts or opinions about that reverse inference problem and how that sort of shows up in neuroimaging and how we can be careful about our conclusions 
knowing that in mind and also how we set up a study to show specific results. So thanks. Yeah, great. A great question. Um, so I think exactly as you say, reverse inference from something like cingulate cortex, you see an activation in cingulate cortex and you say, oh, that must be pain. That is not a good inference because there's lots of different ways to activate cingulate cortex. So I agree, reverse, right. reverse inference from cingulate cortex, bad idea. But I think reverse inference from the fusiform face area is pretty safe because I and other people have tested that region on hundreds of different kinds of conditions. And it's really, really, really selective for faces. And therefore, if you see activation there, it's a pretty good bet that the person is experiencing a face. So my feeling is for, um, reverse inference that is inferring a mental process from a brain activation is a relatively safe thing to do for extremely specific regions of the brain, um, but not from general purpose regions of the brain. Um, so that's my thought about it. I have a follow up. Yep. So how do you think tools like Neurosynth? You know, are you familiar with Neurosynth? I forget. Is that the, the big database of uh yeah, yeah, I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tools like that, how do you think they can help inform some of our set up for how we even establish our hypotheses or our conclusions or how we choose our ROIs. So do you, you know, how do we have any understanding or do you have any understanding of that kind of area? Specifically thinking about like IPS and neuroimaging because often some of our studies focus on that area um, related to mathematical processing. However, it's also the region that's responsible for a lot of other functions, um, especially for the sort of dorsal uh, network. And so I'm wondering, or just interested to see if you think about those tools for meta-analysis or for, you know, all of the sort of positive findings in these studies and the usefulness for that, or I'm wondering, yeah, what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, those are all really great questions. Um, and I'm totally with you with that fine. So I think neurosynth is useful if you have an activation someplace in the brain and you wanna kind of say, okay, what have people found in this vicinity? Great. But as soon as you wanna take really seriously, here's an activation in this person, what does it mean? I wouldn't get near a neurosynth, right? And so yeah. I, I have actually rather strong methodological opinions on this that are a little bit extreme, and I'll just say what they are, and then while acknowledging that not everybody agrees with this. So my feeling is that although I emphasize the fact that the regions I talked about are present in pretty much everybody in more or less the same location across people, they're not in exactly the same location. And that means that whenever you do a group analysis where you align across a bunch of brains, and then ask what's consistent across brains, you, if you get something, great, good for you. But often you don't. If you do a group analysis and look for the fusiform face area, you usually do not find it. Because, and then you look and it's there in every single subject, but it's not enough in the same location to come out. Right, it's and just slightly off. Yeah, and if you do find one in a group analysis and then you look at its response profile, it's not very selective because the region that came through the statistics is mostly not overlapping on most subjects. Right. So, so for all of those reasons, all of the work that I talked about here and everything we do in my lab, if we're going to study a region, the first thing we do is find that region in that subject, exactly. These voxels and only these voxels. And then we ask that region in that subject new questions. Okay, face area, how do you feel about these stimuli? How do you like those stimuli? We measure the response in each subject's independently localized region. Um, because I think that's what you need to do to avoid this conflating things across different locations. So I sure. think, you know, a group in, if you do a group analysis and you find a consistent activation, that's great. That means there is something. But from there on out, to study it, to find out what it is, to quantify its selectivity, I think you need to identify it in each subject to study it. 
Thank you so much for that. Yeah, for that response. It's fascinating. Thank you. Of course, I have a question. I'm going to change topics a little bit. My question is a little bit uh, related to your first slide where you showed, I guess, the topic related to neuro recycling is the topic I want to talk about. So it seems that the face area is there sort of from the get-go, and we've probably inherited that through evolution. We share that area with animals, but you're showing other area or another area called the word form area. We talked about the word form area, which we also know about sort of the number form area as well. Those are not evolutionary. We have to learn that content. So it's impossible that we're born with that area already having developed somewhat. So I guess my question is, why is our brain choosing that specific area for that specific process? Like what's so special about that area that then supports that kind of functioning or reasoning or processing or filtering or whatever we're doing? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, another really good question. Um, I don't know, but my guess is that the priors in the brain that we're born with, what it, what's really built in innately, the main thing is long range connections between one patch of cortex and another. And so multiple people, including Zainab Sagan at Ohio State, uh, has shown that if you use our admittedly imperfect methods to look at long range connectivity in human brains, either diffusion tractography or resting functional correlations. Both of them problematic, but that's all we got. If you use those methods, you can show that the visual word form area has different patterns of long range connectivity to the rest of the brain than its cortical neighbors. In fact, Zainab showed in a paper with me a long time ago that if you scan five-year-olds with diffusion tractography and you measure the connectivity fingerprint of each region in the bottom of the brain, like how much it has long range connections to all these remote other cortical regions, um, and then bring the kids back when they're seven after they learn to read and find their visual word form area, you can predict the location of each kid's visual word form area from the connectivity of that patch of the brain before they learn to read, suggesting that it's these, these kind of these pathways of, you know, structural pathways of connection in the brain um, that determine which functions arise in which locations. Now that just pushes the problem back one step. How does the brain set up all those pathways? What are the, you know, how do you get from genes to a newborn with all those pathways in place? I have no idea. <laughs> I could take that response because it's normally, you know, we're looking at sort of the connections formed in a brain and we know that they're super important. We could also look at sort of learning disabilities and those individuals have those have a set of different connections. So there's some evidence there. It's more than just looking at sort of, it's, it's a superficial part of looking at the brain, I guess. But the other thought I have is that everything within the brain seems to have a specific logic in terms of when we look at the body representation area or the visual word form area or where we're processing things visually, when we look at auditory processing and all of those areas, they all have a structure or a, a foundation that makes sense. It's not like it's just randomly plopped in areas of the cortex. And so maybe if these things are, you know, showing up close to each other, it's weird to assume, but maybe there's there's some foundation there, some basic reasoning why they're there. Maybe it's that easier for that area, one area to process, you know, this type of information than another. So anyway, it's just, I think really interesting to think about that um, in terms of what could the possible support be for a hypothesis like that, or sort of looking at the parallel with how language modality recruits the same cortical regions, um, you know, left area, regardless of whether we have sound or not, right language shows up regardless of modality, it recruits the same cortical areas. And so what is it that's related to this? Is it the specific sensory experience or we can get it more abstractly? 
Yeah. So anyway, I guess all that is to say those areas aren't really processing um, content or concrete content. They're more responsible for abstract processing often. That was my long-winded explanation to get to the question, which I do have another question if no one else has one at the moment. Okay. Somebody looking on the chat. I, I, I'm, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. There aren't any in the QA box as of yet. So the last part of your talk was more about how you're using artificial networks uh, for predictions of activation. And you can use that for predicting sort of your next experiment or looking into what you're about to run an experiment, which I think is really cool. It's a lot cheaper than scanning a bunch of subjects unnecessarily and then having to go back and uh, fix your experiment and running them again. So it's a lot of pain and a lot of money <laughs> saved. Um, so my question is more about, it seems so far that your work is really uh, looking at adult models. Do you think you could use that same reasoning or those artificial networks to look at developmental topics from that perspective? Yep, <laughs> yep. great question. Um, I think in a way, the uh, example I gave is, is a little snippet of how it informs development. Like the case of the spontaneous emergence, the spontaneous segregation of the face system from the object system in a network that has no built-in priors about faces. Like that network is not, you know, normally we think, oh, well, makes sense that we humans have face patches. We're social primates. We care about faces. They matter to us. The network doesn't know anything at all. It's just another pattern that gets another label. And yet it spontaneously segregates them. To me, that says that in principle, it is possible that some of the cortical organization we see could emerge without any domain-specific priors. In other words, you could get domain-specific adult architecture without domain-specific priors in principle. It doesn't mean that's how it has to happen. It just means maybe. Um, and so, I, and there are other people who are taking this farther. So there's beautiful work from a whole bunch of labs recently trying to use these networks to understand how the organization of the cortex might develop. And so one of the things you need to do is you need to put space in the network. Normally those units are just random units in some computer program, but you can assign them space and, and, and have it mean things like built-in constraints that nearby units in a, in a network need to have similar response properties. So several people have been building models like that, including Talia Conkle at Harvard, Dan Yamans at Stanford, a bunch of different people. And they are arguing that in these topographic networks in which you've kind of assigned some meaning to spatial location, you start to get some of the kind of uh, human-like organization of the brain. It's early days in that enterprise, but I think it's super exciting. Um, and I'll just say one other thing about this, which is I, you know, I'm not a developmental psychologist, but it's impossible to look at all this structure in the brain and not wonder how it gets wired up, right? And so to me, it's very tempting to do things like take a network and follow it over the course of training and see how things change over the course of training, see which things arise when, compare that to development, the time course of development of the brain. And on the one hand, that's super tempting and we take a peek and we look at it a little bit. And on the other hand, uh, my computer science friends who are much more savvy about these things than me, the general rule is don't do that. And the reason not to do that is that, um, is that because the learning rules are so different in artificial neural networks um, from however the brain learns that you wouldn't expect the trajectories of development would be the same, even if they both embody some kind of optimization that might lead to a similar end state. Still, nobody can resist it. So on I and others are trying it at the same time feeling nervous that it's not necessarily licensed. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions here? Okay, I think there's no more questions. Then we have some time now uh, for an informal chat with you. So we're gonna close out the session and close out the webinar. Before we do, I want to thank everyone in the audience as well as our remote participants and just remind you of one thing, uh, that our next speaker, Dr. Damaso, actually canceled 
his talk, unfortunately. So I will follow up and see if he could be rescheduled for a different time. But it seems that this year is just very impossible for him to manage. So hopefully next year we'll, we'll try to have him again. So thank you, everyone. Um, in a few months from now, I'll send out an email with the uh, with the survey for, you know, people's feedback, thinking about your thoughts about the speaker series, and if you have comments or suggestions and what you'd like to see um, as a part of the series, then please feel free to let us know once you get that survey. Thank you so much, Dr. Kangwisher. We really appreciate your presentation. And before you go, a parting gift for you. Just something small for you as a token of our appreciation and something to help you remember your visit here by. <laughs> okay, yep, that's our bison, our school mascot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.